Welcome back everyone. In this video, we will focus on the different theories on human motivation. And these theories are divided into two categories. One of them is called content theories and the other one process theories. So we're going to be discussing four in this video, the four which are by content theorists. So here we go. Now, before we begin with the individual theories, I just want to point out that content theories focus on understanding the human needs first. What is it that des everyone desires at the most basic level? And if you can understand what people need, and if you can provide that, then it, then it should in itself provide the motivation that you need to see in the workforce to do well for the business. So it's all about establishing that connection between what people want and how a business can provide them their desired outcomes. And now let's begin with the theories. And the first of these is by our dear friend, Mr. Abraham Maslow. And Maslow coined his theory, the hierarchy of needs. And it's one of the most common and the most talked about theories on human motivation. And his theory is based on a pyramid system where one thing builds on another, builds on another, and eventually leading to an Pre a pre-decided goal for individuals and for companies. That's how a pyramid system is used. And what he does is he designs, he divides rather the human needs into five different categories. And he says that everyone levels up, meaning they uh, first try to accomplish the most basic needs, then level up the next level of needs, so on and so forth. And he divided those needs into five categories and he named them Physiological needs, security needs, social needs, self-esteem needs, and self-actualization. So these are the five levels of human needs according to Mr. Maslow. Now what he says is that everybody wants to work first of all for the most basic things in life. Things that you need to survive, to you know, just simply make sure that you're able to go on till the next day and the next day. And living, um, trying to survive basically, meaning things like food, of course, you need that to survive. You need shelter. You also need health, of course. So any enough, enough to just keep you, you know, going on, being comfortable is what physiological needs is. And as long as those needs are being fulfilled, people will want to work. But then he says that once these are achieved, people will level up, meaning they will look for more. And from physiological needs, they will move on to the security needs, meaning they want to be sure that they won't lose their jobs overnight. Meaning that the you know next day you show up at work and somebody says, oh, you've been replaced. That sort of situation should not occur. And that will come in the form of the employment contracts the business provides. Right, that's something that gives you the job security that you need. And just about the right income will make sure that you're able to survive and look after your family and things like that. So you wanna feel secure in your current situation. That's the second level of needs according to Mr. Maslow. And once these needs are also achieved, just like the physiological needs were achieved, then people will move a level up to social needs meaning they will want to be part of groups, they would want to create teams, uh, they'd want to be liked by others, they don't want to work alone, a uh, sense of belonging to the company, meaning that of course you want to go to work and the work also wants you to come to it. So having that connection with everyone and the social element being developed, that's the next need of people. And once the social needs are also fulfilled, then you go and level up towards self-esteem, meaning you want to feel good about being at your job. You want to get recognition, for, ex for example, making sure that your bosses are rewarding you correctly for the effort that you are putting in. So you want to feel good that I've achieved something, I'm doing well, I'm going ahead in my career. And that's the fourth one. And once people are satisfied with their self-esteem needs, they will go on to the last one, which is self-actualization, which simply says, I have achieved 
so much so far. I've done this. I've, you know, I'm, I'm good at my job. What can I do more with myself? Can I, can I learn a new skill? Can I do something else perhaps? I've tried my career, one, my one career, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. Maybe there's more to me. Maybe I can learn a new skill and develop something completely new which will add more to my personality and my person overall. So it's all about what else? How can I be the best version of myself? And that's what the final frontier for workers are according to Mr. Maslow. And everybody will work through these different steps, the five steps to make sure that they are fully feeling motivated. And the business plays a key role in providing all of these, right? At different stages, for example, at physiological needs, providing the right kind of income will make sure that the workers feel motivated to work for the business. Go a level up, and when it comes to security needs, it's the company contracts, the employment contracts that the business provides to the workers, which makes them feel more secure in their jobs. Social needs can be um, fulfilled by making people managers of a team, or just giving projects and giving them deadlines and giving people the authority and delegation to make their own decisions, be more productive. That will develop a sense of, you know, belonging to the business, social needs being fulfilled. And once that's done, then the business has to recognize the efforts that are being put in by the workers, which comes in the form of promotions, bonuses, etc., etc. And then if you have done well in one department, perhaps try you in another department from marketing to operations, maybe, or to HR. So maybe seeing that what, can, what else can you do, how can you be better at everything than you are right now. Now what Mr. Mezzo says does make sense. Of course, everybody wants more, and the more they achieve, the better they feel, and the more motivated they are. But his motivation theory is not free of criticism and there's a few points that I would like to make here before moving on to the next one which are a little more critical of what Mr. Maslow has to say. First of these is that he believes that everybody goes through the five stages that we discussed in the previous slide. Actually that is not true. Not everybody goes through all the levels. Some levels do not exist for everyone. For example, um, some people may just have a very gung-go attitude to things. They don't want to worry about keeping the job security. They want to keep trying different things, experiment, seeing where things lead them. So maybe that's not in someone's n level of needs. Um, maybe somebody wants to, maybe p some people prefer to work alone, right? If you want to work alone, there won't be so many social needs necessarily. So he assumes that everybody goes through these levels and in this sequence exactly which may not be true secondly there's an argument to be made here that there's there's certain rewards which fit in in all levels of needs for example money right you would like money when you're f at your physiological needs you still like more money at the job security you know social needs security needs self-actualization money will always be a common factor at different levels so I mean, that's just also a criticism or an argument to be made that it's maybe everything is just about money. Thirdly, self-actualization is never permanent, right? For someone who wants to continue to improve themselves, they want to continue to try doing different things. So you will never be stagnant or, you know, at one, you know, just doing the one thing. You will want to try your hand at different things and that's why it will never be permanent. And finally, it's not so easy to detect which level an individual worker is on. Um, maybe someone needs more social, you know, social elements. The so social needs might be high. For someone, it's about time you gave them rewards. So self-esteem is maybe more paramount at that moment. So it will be very difficult for managers to figure out. I mean, and that's the job of the manager, of course, but it's, it's not made easy by having to guess which level each one of their individual employees are. So it's, it's kind of tough to gauge exactly where everyone is. And you know, that's the criticism. But nonetheless, it's, it's a quite sensible theory and we can all relate to it personally that if we level up and if we keep getting the rewards for it, there's no reason not to be motivated. That is Mr. Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs. So the second of these content theories is by this guy called Mr. Herzberg. 
and not Heisenberg. No, no, Mr. Herzberg. So Mr. Herzberg, his theory is called the two-factor theory. And I will also point out here that uh, and when we did a theory on managers, the dude's name there was Mintzberg. So don't mince that here with Herzberg. Herzberg is the guy with the content theory on human motivation, which is called the two-factor theory. And Mr. Herzberg says that, you know what drives people is a combination of two things. And he says that a business needs to be aware of both sides and provide them so that a worker feels compelled to do well for the business and compelled, of course, willingly wanting to do well for the business. And he divided those, those factors into motivation factors and hygiene factors. So according to Herzberg, he says that first, you've got to give the people the incentive to work hard. I mean, things that should drive them, that should want them to work more for the business. And everybody likes to work towards a promotion. Okay, of course, that means replacing your boss, getting a nicer car. So everybody wants that. Everybody wants to be recognized in front of all the important people in the business so that you also feel a little bit taller. You want to achieve things, so you want to be given targets so that you feel that you are getting somewhere in your career. And sometimes the work itself, if it's challenging enough, it will make you work harder. And of course, you also want to develop a skill. And as long as you're challenged, you really find out about yourself. What can you do? How far can you go? So as long as all these are provided by a business, it will keep the workers motivated, meaning wanting to do more for the business. That's the first side of his theory, the motivation factors. But he also said that you need to provide them with hygiene factors. You know, of course, this does not mean you wash their hands every, uh, every hour. It simply means that hygiene factors are those factors that stop your workers from getting any more demotivated. Yeah, of course, I mean, the wanting to work more is a conscious effort made by a, by a worker. So for that, the motivation factors are there. But as a business, you should provide a minimum cutoff that at least that much we can provide to the worker so that he does not feel like not wanting to be at work. So things like if you pay them a satisfactory pay, so according to the work that they're doing, a fair pay, it will not demotivate anyone. If you give them good working conditions, so if you come in, the lights and fans, the air conditioning, equipment, iPads and iPads and things like that, if you're providing the right kind of environment at work, then people would want to be there, which will obviously stop them from getting more demotivated. Uh, having fair policies, making sure they're being followed and applied to everyone across the organization. When you feel that everyone is being treated equally, of course, you would not feel more demotivated. And <coughs> just a little bit of interest from your managers, you know, little chat at the end of the day, how are things going? You know, how are things at home? Are you keeping healthy? Just that conversation with the manager will feel like the company cares for them. So as long as you're providing these factors, then it will prevent any further demotivation. Okay, and he says that, of course, he is very much mindful of the fact that these may not by themselves motivate people to do more. And for those, we have these motivation factors. The third theorist on our list is Mr. Frederick Taylor and his scientific theory. And he kept it really simple. And he simply said, show me the money. Okay, he believes that people are motivated by money. And that's all really you need to talk to them about that. Look, if you this much, you get this bag of money. If you do that much, you get another bag of money. So people, you should identify what drives people and if it's money then it's Taylor's theory that you are looking at. So he firmly believes in the idea that you should pay a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. So may if, if you've seen people putting in the effort they should be rewarded financially according to that effort. And of course different people can have different levels of um, efforts put in and different people have different ways of doing the same job I mean he understands that but he wanted to simplify that and he said that and he divided his theory into three parts and he said that first you need to identify the most efficient way to complete a task 
Now, why is theory is called the scientific theory is because the scientific way states that you should find the, the shortest way or the most efficient way possible to go from point A to point B. And he says that you need to first figure out, let's say if uh, we're taking off a car manufacturer and it's about fitting tires on a car. Find out what's the most efficient way to do that. So fewest number of steps taken to put a car, put a tire on the car. Once you figure that out, you make sure that all the workers are trained in that most efficient method. Of course, you don't want any inefficiency of the business. Inefficiency costs you money. So whatever work or whatever number of workers you have, make sure they're all at their most efficient level by being, <coughs> excuse me, by being trained in that most efficient method. And once everybody's trained and given exact um, or I wouldn't say order exact targets to work towards, then pay them on the basis of their results. And he also linked this to the type of payment that you can pay based on this. So when you get the results of the workers, you can pay them in two ways, either according to the time they have put in, so time-based payment system, or the number of units they're able to produce. So let's say you get $10 a unit. If you make 10 units, you get $100, right? If you work for five hours, you work, well let's say you were getting $10 an hour, so you get $50. So link the effort with immediate financial rewards. And once that's done, once the workers are given their rewards, then show them the money. And of course, everybody would like a little bit more. And he strongly believes, Mr. Taylor, that money is the real motivator. Now, some of the criticism of Mr. Taylor's theory is, of course, the first one being that not everyone is driven by money. I mean, yeah, everybody needs a, you know some level of it to survive, but the will to do more is not always dependent on money for everyone. Someone wants to just want to achieve things. People just want to feel more powerful in a position. So money is not always going to motivate everyone equally. Also, he believes that workers are like machines, so find the most efficient way, train everyone, do it in X number of steps. So when you give people those very, very specific instructions, they feel like robots, and that's not going to get the best out of people if they're not able to give their feedback or make changes according to you know their own feeling um, you know, while they are working on a particular product. So don't take workers as robots. That's a big criticism of Taylor's theory. Also, the most efficient way may not be suitable for everyone. I mean, you, two different workers may have two different skill sets and what works for one worker may not work for the other one. So don't assume that everyone can do the most efficient, mo everyone can learn the most efficient method equally well. And finally, if you train people to just do everything with X number of steps and get the right number of units done and the right amount of time, then quality may be compromised. P if you are paying people by the number of units, then you know, think about it logically that if your only job is to make 100 units in a day and be done with it and you get paid for it, then you'd want to do it as quickly as possible so you can do the next 100. That means your focus is not necessarily going to be on the quality of the product but rather the quantity of the product. So a few criticism of Taylor's theory, and he is simply on the side of Show me the money. Last, but by no means the least, is Mr. Elton Mayo's motivation theory. Mm, that reminds me of garlic mayo with fries. Anyways, let's not get sidetracked. Mr. Elton Mayo's motivation theory is rather simple. Hey, well, his his study was in two parts, and in the first part, when he conducted his research, he initially thought that there are two motivators, two things that will make sure that people are working towards a better outcome. So the first of those factors is good working conditions. Okay, that means that creating the kind of environment that makes people want to be at the workplace, so the right equipment, the right training, the right sort of supervision, everything that keeps the whole workplace 
happy for an employee that should be maintained by a business in order to maintain the motivation levels and along with that he said that you obviously give people the right uh, payments for the work they do so monetary rewards should be provided equally but as he continued with his th studies he figured out that there's a couple more things that you need to provide to your employees and it's a combination of these four which will eventually lead to a more motivated workforce so he said that you also need to provide your workers with opportunities to interact and collaborate meaning you should encourage teamwork you should encourage things like quality circles which we will look at in the next chapter but i'll just shed a light on it that quality circles is the process where a business asks its employees to give them feedback as to how to improve the everyday processes for employees and not just on the work production side but also maybe more vacations or a four day work week things like that those suggestions to be provided to the com to the company from the workers is what we call quality circles so providing those opportunities to collaborate for the business and showing interest from you know the supervisors on the managers into the everyday working of the workers just ask them if they need your help uh, should they need any guidance or anything related to you know career advice perhaps so as long as these four things are being provided mr mio says that it will keep your workforce motivated so four theories in content theorists after this in the next video we will shift our focus towards the process theorists see you there